Good evening and welcome to our Waltham Public Library program, These Are Extraordinary Times with Waltham cartoonist and memoirist Maria Fotonakis. My name is Deborah Hoffman and I organize programs and events for the library. Thanks for tuning in. Before we start, I wanna let you know how the evening will go. Our speaker will talk about her writing process, then we'll go through some workshopping prompts and then she'll field questions from you. To ask questions via the chat function, use a Google account to sign into YouTube. Feel free to write your questions at any time and then I'll read them at the end of the presentation. Maria Fotonakis is an illustrator, memoirist and comic book artist exploring narratives about resilience, alienation and self-discovery. Liminal State, her comic on grief and post postpartum anxiety won a MICE 2019 grant. Then for over a year and a half, she documented her life with a young child during the COVID-19 pandemic in a visual journal called Extraordinary Times and received a MICE 2021 honorable mention and a grant via the Massachusetts Cultural Council for this work. This latter work will be the focus of her talk tonight. Maria is the child of Greek immigrants. She studied journalism, French, and Japanese at UMass Amherst. Her current projects include a children's book and a YA graphic novel. Welcome Maria Fotonakis, and thank you so much for being here tonight. Thank you so much for having me. I'm thrilled to be here. Um, I'm so excited to get started. I have a presentation to start, and I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. You get that going. All right. Do I, does it look good? Are we good? Yes. Excellent. Okay. So hi everyone. I'm Maria. Thank you again for the wonderful intro. Um, and yes, uh, this uh, presentation is going to focus on my extraordinary times, visual comic pandemic journal. Uh, and I, I thought it'd be interesting to start uh, just for a comparison between where I was in March and May 2020 on the left here versus May 2021 on the right, what a difference a year makes. Uh, and also um, what a difference a year can make in terms of art progression, which I think a lot of people find really interesting. So I thought I would just start with that. Uh, so again, hi, I got that wonderful intro, so I'll just do this real quick. I, I am, I live in Waltham. I grew up here in Massachusetts, uh, as mentioned. My background is not in art, it's in journalism and Japanese. I also studied French. Um, and my path to art's been really weird. Uh, I started in computer science. Uh, I did that for a few years in college. I left it to study journalism instead. And after I graduated, I worked as a journalist for a few years, managed to change my career into tech marketing. And then about five years ago, I uh, transitioned to also doing art, both as commercial illustration and for doing comics sort of for myself. Um, and on the bottom of the screen here, you can see the cover of some of my work. Uh, Liminal State is the, the piece I did in 2019 that, uh, as mentioned, won a MICE mini grant, a Massachusetts Independent Comic Expo uh, mini grant. Uh, and that was actually my first real foray into memoir making. So uh, after that won an award, I figured I might be onto something with that and I should maybe continue. Um, another one of my works that was memoir related is Early Motherhood Hour by Hour. And this is a compilation of uh, comics that I did when my daughter was an infant and then a year later again as a toddler just documenting what life was like as a stay-at-home mom uh and also freelancer <laughs> with a baby and a toddler underfoot just every hour of my day for one day what that was like and uh, my daughter's now four and i look back on that and it's like a whole other world um i've also managed to uh i've been doing a lot of illustration work in the last couple of months especially since life has picked up and my daughter's back in school and i have some samples of my work below there just to show that i'm just doing a bunch of different things here so extraordinary times <laughs> just to give an intro on what this project was um end of march end of february early march 2020 i was actually on vacation in san diego with my husband and my daughter we flew back to boston uh the night of march 8th landing right around midnight so technically march 9th and we all knew around that time that life was about to really change we didn't know quite how um, and my journalistic instincts came through and I said, I should probably document what's going to happen. But I know that the headlines and the big world changing stuff, that's going to be well documented by all the news organizations of the world. So nobody's going to be telling my story unless I tell it. So I'd better write it down. 
So I sat down with a sketchbook that I had handy at my dining room table. This is literally the picture I took. And I wrote these words. These are extraordinary times. Uh, Cause I just knew this was just gonna go haywire and real crazy. And that's how it started. Just that simple sketchbook at my dining room table. And for a year and a half, I kept that going. Um, this was the very first thing I drew. And I will completely admit the art is really rough. And uh, this is not how I, I would approach a page like this right now. But this was just me trying to figure out how to write down, hey, what's happening? What's happening in my family? And how can I channel all this anxiety that I've got from this massive amount of change that's happening very quickly? How can I put that into something maybe productive, maybe something that's going to comfort me? Um, and what can I also make with no time? Because at the, at the time, my daughter was two. So what can I make with no time and the constant interruptions of a two-year-old underfoot? Uh, and this is before school and childcare went away, but didn't mind you, it got even worse once that went. Um, and for the first week, especially, I was documenting what life was feeling like every single day of that first week, like the early March week. Um, and I knew how important it was for me to write down what was happening to my family, because again, no one's going to do that but me. Um, and I wanted to also document for my daughter, what not only mom and dad were experiencing, but what was she experiencing? I mean, what's two year old going to remember from all this? very little specific, I would imagine. Uh, and I wanted her to know when she's an adult that all these things that were happening around her um, and, and how resilient she was, frankly, and how resilient she continues to be. And to me, another important component of this was also writing down how I felt about what was happening. Because I can't really, I can guess at what my daughter was feeling and I, I can always surmise from how she's acting, excuse me. But I, I authentically can tap into what I was feeling and I can document that. And she'll have a channel into that experience through me writing down my feelings. And especially at the beginning when things were changing so much, I also was asking myself, what details am I going to forget from this? And I have been surprised looking back even, <laughs> it's only been a year and a half, almost two years now, but looking back at those early days, how much I've already forgotten. And I'm really glad I captured it. So when I wrote down the first entries, and uh, these are all very roughly drawn, very roughly hewn. I shared a few of them on Facebook with some friends and I just figured, eh, I don't know. I don't know if anyone's gonna be interested in this, but I thought I would just let people know, hey, I just did this, I made a thing. And <laughs> my surprise, people actually wanted to read this. Um, and I'm still kind of shocked by that, but uh, that was the reaction I got. People said you should put that online so I can see more of what you're working on. So that's what I did. Um, I started making more entries whenever I had the time and I published them on a platform called Webtoon. Uh, which is just basically a distribution platform for web comics. That's how this all started. And it's, uh, I made, at the, by the end of the project, 43 entries uh, for Extraordinary Times, most of them at least five pages long, if not longer. Um, and that's how many of my readers ended up finding me. So over the course of the, this project, the very, very beginning, things were changing all the time. And a lot of my updates were, here's what's happening, here's how we're dealing with it. But as we all know, especially once, last summer kicked in and we all just kind of we made a lot of the adjustments and we were just sort of living or barely living you know um it, it was a lot about how i was feeling and trying to cope so this entry from june 30th called miasma um this one was one that i a lot of people told me they resonated with it was me documenting how frustrated i was with the pandemic brain fog forgetting things having no emotional reserves to draw from uh, and, and not having any real coping mechanisms to help me through things uh, and knowing that my husband was also dealing with the same thing. And of course, also trying to document how, at this point, my daughter was three, how a three-year-old slots into this. Um, the, the joy and randomness of a three-year-old child brings to the brain fog. Uh, things kind of get a weird, absurd quality to them. Um, but also, she's a great reminder that life moves on and has to continue somehow, which was very helpful for me. And yet, and yet, that miasma completely consumed me. And, you know, when I wasn't in mommy mode, it was just like, ugh. So um, this entry was the one that I think a lot of people started to pay attention to what I was doing after this point, because it was that description of that, that brain fog I just could not escape. Um, so at the end of this project, I continued all the way from March 8th, 2020 to July 19th, 2021. I had ended up filling see if I can lift this up and show the camera. Nine watercolor sketchbooks. This is this is them. All of them right there. 
Uh, it's 276 pages drawn and painted, 43 webcomic updates, and two book volumes. Uh, the second one is the one that just came out in August, and that compiles entries from August of 2020 through the final entry of July 2021, mainly because th things slowed down so much that I didn't need to document as often of what was going on. Um, the my My work got a lot more reflective, and I would start reflecting as opposed to here's what happened today, here's what happened the last two days, it would be, here's what happened the last month, here's my sort of recollection of the last month of life, such as it is. And yeah, I ended my my pandemic journal, even though the pandemic's still going on. Um, <laughs> I addressed this in my final entry. I just emotionally couldn't keep carrying on with it. It just was becoming way too draining. So uh, I, I wrote in my final entry sort of like a prayer that things would get better, but also acknowledging that we are still in the middle of it. So I want to talk a little bit about um, how I made it and what my guiding principles and takeaways were for making a project like this. Because when you make a comic for publication, usually you go through a long iterative process where you write a script out, you edit it, you work with an editor, uh, you refine, you refine, you refine, you thumbnail your work, you refine, you refine your artwork. Uh, there, there's a lot of iterations. And all of that got thrown out the window with this project for me mainly because of the pressures of time, uh, especially once um, childcare went away like a month into the pandemic for me. Um, I, I really just, I had absolutely no free time anymore. It's something I talk about a lot in the book itself, in both books about how my sense of self just disappeared and I just became mommy all the time and how draining that was. Um, but I also had to learn how to work within these extremely tight time constraints of like 10 minutes here, 15 minutes there. What can I possibly get done when ideally making a comics project or any kind of art project, you get hours of uninterrupted time to get into flow. That was just not possible for me. So for me, the number one thing was just do whatever I could whenever I could with whatever I had at hand. And yes, I know fancy artist stuff like these fancy paint palettes, not everybody's got them lying around. Um, this is a travel paint palette, by the way, so it's nothing extraordinary special, but I was making a lot of these entries either in my living room on the sofa or at my dining room table like i could not escape to my studio and get hours of free time to work it was just wherever i was in arm's reach of my daughter often drawing with my daughter right next to me watching me <laughs> or sitting on my lap in some cases just get it down on the page as even if it's completely unedited even if it's really raw and really uh, unsophisticated sometimes it just needed to get on the page to be documented um, another principle that I that guided me through this year and a half project was not to pick it up, not to pick up the sketchbook or the, the paintbrush if it started to feel like homework or if I just felt like emotionally I could not handle it in that moment because we all had enough going on. There was no need for me to make life difficult or put something that's supposed to be fun and calming and helpful and making that into torture. That was just the absolute last thing I needed. So this was only something I could do when it made sense for me to do it emotionally, which is not how deadlines generally work. <laughs> um, related to my first point of doing whatever I can whenever I could, uh, perfection is the enemy of done, and I was wanted to get these entries done so I could record what was happening. Uh, some light editing is always good though. So I would do a very minor iterative process of jotting down notes either in like my iPhone notes app or on an index card of just maybe a word or two of, uh, that would prompt my memory and maybe cross a few things out if I said, you know, I don't think that needs to go in there. But then beside that, I would just go put it right on the page and, and not do any editing much beyond that. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, for me, this project was about documenting my personal experiences and perspectives because the news is going to be well documented. So whenever I felt like I didn't know what to say, it was I, I wanted to hyper focus on my life. And especially for volume two of Extraordinary Times, it was how have we started to adjust? There's no new normal. I hate that phrase. But how have we just started to adjust to just living with this pandemic right now? What's it like sending a preschooler to school with masks on and seeing how three and four year olds, at least in my, the kids in my life's case, they just don't care about masks at all. They, they wear them with no problem. And what it's like to not be able to do the things you thought you would when you became a parent or how they're very different. Um, that's what I wanted to document was that difference. And finally, <laughs> as weird as this might say, I had to try and forget that anyone else was reading this. Uh, again, not usually what you do when you make something for publication, but this is such a personal project and it is documenting my life. 
I didn't want to start thinking about how was I going to be perceived by people reading this. It, it's impossible to put that completely out of your mind, but you want to try and forget it because I wanted it to be as authentic to my experience as possible. And I didn't want to try and filter it through like, what's the audience going to think? It just needs to be unadulterated me. And just to, just to drive home the point of, I didn't want anything getting in my way of making this work, no matter what, uh, I am extremely lucky that I have an art studio shed in my backyard. It's my little she shed. And in August, 2020, two neighbors trees uh, collapsed on it during a microburst storm. And I could not access any of my work for about a month and a half, which it was not great. Um, so I did a lot of my work on post-it notes uh, for that time. And actually in volume two, you can see the post-it note entries that I did. Uh, post-it notes are a great stand-in for comics panels. They're, they're obviously not highbrow or very high polish, but I just didn't want the pandemic or a storm in this case to take yet another thing away from me. So I said, you know what, if I can't draw on my sketchbooks, I will draw on post-it notes because I've got to do it. Another principle for me for making this project um, th throughout the last year and a half was sort of to think like a documentarian or someone who makes a documentary, but not to necessarily abide by like documentary rules. So I was taking a lot of photos of the ephemera of the pandemic. And it's kind of depressing, to be honest with you, to take pictures of like the public health orders or COVID rules. Uh, and I will be honest, I didn't use all of this material in my comics, but sometimes I did. And it was so helpful having that. Um, like this picture of my daughter's stuffy with a mask on that I made for my daughter. I never ended up using it, but uh, it did prompt me to remember the whole process of making masks uh, that I, I did uh, late April of last year. Um, but the picture of my mother getting her second COVID vaccine at Gillette, that I, I referenced directly in an entry that I made. Uh, so it was helpful to take all these photos for documentation for myself, but not all of it's going to get used and that's okay. My process, and it started off extremely rough of, in terms of just jotting down what's happening. It got a lot, really refined over the course of the last year and a half. So especially by the time I got onto the volume two entries, this is what it looked like. Um, I, unless something was really urgent, like the presidential election or January 6th or something where things have just happened, for the most part, uh, I, I wanted to give the dust a few days to settle in my mind and let my subconscious do some filtering and let the important things start to start to bubble up and the less important stuff fall away. And that happens when we sleep. That happens when we don't think about stuff. It, it's a very important time to let my brain life fallow, you know? Um, and then what I would do is maybe a few days after uh, an event or when I felt like it was time for me to write a new entry, I would just write standout moments, anything that just came to mind. Uh, it, there's, there's really no science to this. It was just sit down, think of five things, whatever comes to mind as absurd as it might be, even if it's a word or two, and then just notice stuff. Is there any connecting thread between the things that I wrote down? Um, what do I want to keep? What should I omit? Uh, is there something that maybe in this process is making me realize I've forgotten? And that's interesting that I forgot it. Why did I forget that? Maybe that's important. Um, does this thing that I remember or was this thing that bubbled up over the last few days, does it stir up any related memories from other times in my life? And if so, why? Uh, in some cases, I do explore um, like uh, stories that I heard about my great grandmother who died in the 1918 pandemic, the flu pandemic. It was my grandmother's only memory of my great grandmother was of her mother dying in the bed. I mean, it's like, of course, when that came up on my mind, I said, I should probably include that. Um, and was, is there any takeaway in this chain of uh, events that may form a narrative? Or am I just documenting what happened? Because both approaches are in this project for me were fine. Usually people, would choose one or another, they they might choose to say, hey, this is what happened and I'm just writing it down as it goes. Um, other people might chain together a bunch of really different events in their life to make one coherent narrative. I did both. Um, I also thought it was really important to sift through my notes and documentation with care uh, to make sure that I didn't let photographic reality overwrite what I thought or what I recollected. And that might seem a little abstract, but what my brain chooses to remember feels with memoir work sometimes more important that what then what actually happened let me say that again what i choose to remember or what my brain tells me may sometimes be more important than what actually happened and i know that seems weird um but it, there's a lot that's revealed by what your mind will remember and it can tell an interesting story if you look into it 
Uh, and finally, with a project like this, where you're working with these tiny little bursts of time, you have to acknowledge and just give in to the fact that frustration and fatigue, just, they certainly did, did happen in the last year and a half. My motivation failed a whole bunch of times. I There were times where I would go like a month without making an entry because I just couldn't do it. Uh, sometimes life got crazy busy. Not not often in the last year and a half, but sometimes it did. Uh, and sometimes my daughter just uh, would interrupt me when I wanted to paint or draw. And I put that picture there. This was not uncommon. Uh, and, you know, she was part of this, too. So you just had to let that happen. Um, one thing I just wanted to mention, because this always comes up when I talk about memoir comics, because it's extremely important, is about privacy and consent. Uh, there's a quote from a comics artist, Caitlin Chan. She's based out of Hong Kong. She does amazing memoir comics. And I put a quote from her here. Um, but the, in some of what she says is she focuses on what she has to say rather than telling stories about other people unless they're a public figure like the president or unless they've given active consent. So the comic is true in feeling, but identifiers and faces are changed. And I think that's just super important when you're talking about memoir work. I'm very lucky that my husband knows and enthusiastically consents to being in my comics. Um, he shares them with his coworkers and friends. It's kind of amazing. My mother also knows what's going on. My daughter is too young to consent. She knows she knows that I'm drawing. She sees her picture in my sketchbooks, but she doesn't understand what's going on. So it's very important to me that um, I try to keep the focus as much as possible on myself and my feelings. She's obviously a part of my orbit. She's a part of my story, especially at the, her young age. Um, but I don't want to embarrass her. I anonymize her as much as I can, and I, I only want to keep what's necessary. So if, if something that she did or said is necessary for a, the story, I will keep it, but I'm not going to do just general, hey, here's what she did, because that's just that's not of anybody's business. Um, in general, I keep everybody anonymous and keep mentions of them high level, especially if they don't know that I'm a comics artist, although I don't tend to hide that. Uh, and the the feeling I went for with all these entries was to keep it raw. It's, it is raw because I'm putting it on the page very quickly and I'm not really editing it and it's authentic in that way, but I'm not looking to be mean or gossipy. That's just the antithetical to my whole philosophy. So these two pages on the on the screen are some of my favorites because they're when my mom got vaccinated and they're when I got vaccinated and they're both in volume two and they're just such a contrast from the first volume, which is all like life has been upended and what's going to happen. It's the hope. Um, and I, I just wanted to put those in there because the, the hope just even when I look at these pages now, it fills me with so much joy. Um, the takeaways from working on this specific project, because I've done memoir work before, but this project was very different. People do really like learning the ins and outs of your life, especially if they've been following your project over a year or more. And to the point that sometimes folks can feel a little entitled to knowing like little details about you. But just remember, if you are creating something like this, that you and the people in your life have the right to privacy. You do not have to put everything in there. Like I didn't include what my family did for Thanksgiving and Christmas because frankly, it's none of anybody's business. And I didn't think it was actually going to help the narrative much. So I left it out. Um, you will be surprised as a, if you're a creator or a reader, <laughs> you will always be surprised what people connect with. Um, I was certainly very surprised what people connected with. Um, there were some entries that I wrote where I was like, oh, this one's so killer. I'm so proud of it. I spent a lot of, for me, a lot of time working on it and nobody liked it. <laughs> and then there were other things like the entry I did about my mom getting vaccinated. People connected with it so much, it actually got me new gigs, which <laughs> like paying work. I couldn't, I, it was amazing. You, I couldn't force that. I didn't anticipate that. It just was what happened. Um, people, readers are smart and readers can always tell if a memoirist is not being genuine. And I feel like that uh, comes across in connection. If you can't connect with a memoir work, I feel like that's probably because something's being omitted that should be there. Um, and someone's choosing to not be emotionally or intellectually honest. Uh, even in a pandemic, which stunk, I mean, it stinks and it stunk, uh, there are there are ups and downs. So if you're just always negative or, or weirdly always positive, like that's going to turn everybody off. So you have to acknowledge all the all the shades of what's going on. Um, but sometimes there's joy and it's OK to be joyful, even in the middle of a pandemic. When I got that vaccine in my arm, I really thought I heard the angels sing. I was so happy. Um, and the final takeaway is this stuff is really hard work emotionally. It, you know, it's hard work in terms of the art and the writing, uh, but it, it does put you through an emotional ringer. And that's actually part of the reason I stopped doing this in July of this year 
is that you have to replay a lot of these events in your head to figure out what you want to say. And sometimes you don't want to go over these things again. You want to forget them. So you have to kind of be careful with yourself and, uh, and acknowledge that this, this, this can be really hard work. Uh, so yes, Extraordinary Times Volumes 1 and 2. Volume 2 is the one that just came out recently in, in August, and Volume 1 was last year. Um, they are available at the Waltham Public Library. You can check both of them out. And if you're in the Minuteman Library loan, you can check them out that way. Or you can buy them from me directly through my online store at photinakis.com slash store. Um, I would love to hear from anyone who's read my work. Uh, I would love to hear your thoughts. I've heard from people with kids, people without kids, people whose kids have long flown the nest, young adults who are just, I, I mean, I've, I've heard from people of all sorts of walks of life. And it is continually humbled me how much people connect with the work I did. So I would love to hear from you if you take a look at my work. Uh, you can find me, there's my website, photinakis.com, and my Instagram is at mphotinakis. You can see what I'm up to there. Uh, and I appreciate your support and your time. Uh, that's it for my presentation, but I will do my workshop next. I think I'm good on time, right? Yeah. Okay, great. Let me just get out of my slideshow. Okay. <laughs> so next is making a memoir comic of your own. Um, one thing I like to emphasize about comics is that it's a very democratic art form. And although you've seen me using maybe fancy pencils or fancy paint, you really don't need any of that. All you need is pencil or pen and paper. And I mean that really sincerely that you, that is the best way to get started. And you don't want to get hung up on the materials that you use with comics. With a lot of other art forms, it matters a lot. But when you're just getting started and you just want to get something on the page, sometimes post-it notes and pencils can be the tool to use just to get something down. It can be just your first draft, but it can be the way to start. Um, there are a lot of fantastic books on comics and making comics and the craft of making comics. And if you're really interested in this stuff, I will gladly list a bunch of the books later. The one that um, I recommend for everybody getting it from my little prop, is Understanding Comics by Scott McCloud. This is a fascinating read for anyone who reads comics or wants to make them. It's all about the craft, not just in American comics, but comics all around the world, and how we connect with them, with the tools that we use. It's just a fascinating read, and actually there's a whole series of books that he did on them, but I recommend that to anyone who wants to learn more. Um, but there's also a another book that I recommend for people who want to learn the craft of making comics by one of the comics maestros, Ivan Brunetti, and it's called Cartooning, quite simply. Um, Brunetti is a cartoonist and a comics teacher, and he has a lot of fantastic exercises in here, some of which I'm going to have us do, um, that get you thinking about the very different way that comics are made, because it's not like when you're sitting in high school art class and your teacher's like, draw your hand, you have a week to do it. It's Comics are about getting things done quickly and clarity and making it very as clear as possible. And I said that in the most unclear way I possibly could. It's about, <laughs> it's about saying things in a very clear way, sometimes in a concise way, but also getting it done quickly. Because usually cartoonists, we have deadlines. Uh, usually we have to work pretty fast and you just don't have a week to draw a hand. You just don't. You have maybe a day to, walk, to do five panels. Um, so you, thinking about drawing is a little different from thinking about making comics but there there's some relation so there's there's an exercise in this book that, that will sort of demonstrate what i'm trying to say um i'm going to get my timer out for my phone so i'm going to do this with everybody and it's quite simply to draw a cat that sounds real easy right what we're going to do is we're going to draw a cat but we're going to do it four times <laughs> so what i'm going to ask is get any writing implement of choice if it's a pencil a pen and even if you say, I can't draw, Maria, I can't draw, that's fine. I've read some fantastic comics that were literally stick figures. And they're actually like New Yorker cartoonists who do stick figures. So that's never an excuse. If you can draw a circle and a square, you can draw. So <laughs> get a piece of paper, get a note card. I really like index cards, even the line index cards. They're, they're great for just doodling on or post note, whatever you like. Grab your drawing material. And what we're going to do is draw a cat for three minutes which is a lot of time and then we're going to do it again for one minute and then we're going to do it again for 30 seconds and i'll do a timer for each one and each time you're going to start in you so you're not going to work on the same cat you're going to do a new cat every time so i'll do it with you to, to demonstrate 
what this will look like. So let's get started. So let's see, 30 seconds on my timer. And actually, you know, what am I saying? I said three minutes. Three minutes on my timer. Okay, there's my timer sound. Okay, so we have three minutes. I'm going to be heads down drawing, but you draw with me. So for three minutes on your piece of paper, please draw a cat. And the timer starts now. And if you really are not into cats, you can draw a dog. Just <laughs> they can be doing whatever you like. Don't need to worry about dialogue or anything like that. Just draw a cat. I always feel like I'm cheating because I have two cats and I love to draw them. <laughs> hard for me to do this in three minutes. I'm already done. <laughs> I feel like I'm cheating. <laughs> I'll, I'll add more. Got about one minute left. Okay, that is the timer. That is the three minute timer. Okay, so I will show you mine. <laughs> it's not, I'm not the world's greatest artist. I will never pretend that I am, but I, I just, I actually was struggling to figure out how to fill three minutes. But <laughs> uh, I, the thing I want us to notice is were there things that gave us trouble with drawing the cat? Like, were there certain things that were really easy that were like, oh yeah, that, like the line of the arch of the cat's back or the ears, super easy, but I don't know about the feet. Uh, just remember that, notice that, think about that, because we're going to do it again. So put this cat to the side and grab a fresh sheet of whatever, or just if you're on a big piece, just move down, whatever. And then we're going to do a cat again, but we're going to do it in one minute. All right, ready? Thirty seconds. Three 
three, two, one. There we go. Okay. Intense. I know. <laughs> so my three minute cat, my one minute cat, just to contrast here, not exactly the same pose. I, that's not a requirement, but if you choose. So certain things start to drop away pretty quickly. And again, I know I'm not the greatest artist, <laughs> but certain things start to drop away. Um, certain details become less important. We we sort of subconsciously, well, I'm a cartoonist, so I do this more, maybe a little more easily, but notice in your work as well that certain things have started to drop away that maybe weren't as important. Um, if you didn't complete the cat figure, that's okay. Just notice what you did complete, what parts you completed, and maybe if that's interesting. Um, I don't know about you, but I actually prefer my one minute over my three minute cat. I feel like it's more interesting, maybe because I knew I had a deadline, so I had to work fast. So let's see what happens when we have only 30 seconds to draw a cat. And again, try if you can do the whole cat, that's great. Uh, but no worries if you can't, just try, do your best. Okay, I'm gonna do a 30 second timer. And the thing is sometimes these get as fast as like 10 seconds, but I'm not gonna do that, we'll stop at 30. Okay, ready, go. Ten seconds left. <laughs> oh gosh. <laughs> Two, one. Ah! <laughs> it's bonkers. I know. Okay. <laughs> That's intense. Okay, so a thirty second cat or sorry, three minute cat. One minute cat. <laughs> thirty second cat. Let me get the camera on there. <laughs> really, really basic, but um, it's efficient and honestly i can probably draw a cat in 10 15 seconds of and again it won't be it won't be hanging in the gardener museum but it gets the point across it's a cat and that's that's why i, I want to make sure that people understand a distinction between like fine art drawing and cartooning is we we need to communicate the idea you want to make it nice it does not need to be rembrandt it really doesn't and in fact that will be antithetical to your goals if you're trying to be a cartoonist because you want to get stuff done you don't want to take forever on it. Otherwise, it'll take you a millennium to finish a book, and that's no good. So we're going to do this exercise. Well, we're not going to do this. Ah, do we want to do this one more time? Nah. I'll have us do a different exercise. Instead of, hmm, we're going to draw ourselves, and I'm going to give us oh, a minute to do it. <laughs> so before we embark on a self-portrait in, in cartoon form, if you cannot draw and you're saying, Maria, I cannot draw, please don't make me do this. A stick figure is fine. Remember that a head is basically a circle. A body can be basically a rectangle and you can have sticks or arms and legs. This is how my four-year-old draws and that is totally fine. Again, there are New Yorker cartoonists who draw like that, so it's okay. It's the idea is communicating who you are in a really simplified form. So one thing that cartoonists like to use are props. So a lot of us cartoonist types tend to wear funky glasses because it's really easy. You see someone's face and they've got very unique glasses and you're like, oh, that's their signature. Sometimes if you have like really cool hair, you can have like an exaggerated, like I used to draw myself with basically an Afro when I had more hair. Um, I never had an Afro, but I, I thought of myself as having a big curly head of hair, which is long gone. Um, but I, that was sort of my signature in high school. Uh, some people um, do a, a special shirt, like a hoodie, whatever, or a mustache, like whatever's distinctive. You can think of maybe what a shortcut is for you, like a little visual identifier. That is a great way if you're doing a one minute self-portrait to think about like, this is what makes me, me. So I know I'm throwing a lot on your plate to think about like, hey, what's your special thing? If you can think of something great, if not, no worries. But again, I'm going to give us one minute to draw a self-portrait and I will show you mine. So don't worry. <laughs> and it's going to be, you know, funny. Uh, <laughs> okay. So are we ready? Self-portrait, one minute. Thirty seconds left. You can do it.
Ooh, that's a timer. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I almost forgot. All right, all right. So timer off. Gosh. Okay. Here's my one minute portrait. This is not the grandest work of art. Yay. Thank you for the thumbs up. <laughs> it's just the idea of me. I am not slim. <laughs> I, 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 you know, I don't look like this that much, really. I mean, maybe, uh, maybe. Uh, uh, but the, the idea is that if I consistently use this avatar in my comics, people will know this is my stand in. So if you're going to do a memoir comic, this is the most important character in your comic. Uh, unless you're doing a biography, in which case it's your other character, but memoir is you. So you want to spend some time thinking about it. But it's very, it's the temptation for newbies is to spend like an hour on your self portrait and, you know, the parlor painting of you looking grand, you want it to be simple, you want to be able to draw yourself in like 30 seconds, and have it be identifiably you. So if you want to draw a memoir comic, try try that exercise to do with the cat, start with three minutes, work down to a minute, do 30 seconds. And if you can do 10 challenge mode, but you can do it. And if you've got like a somewhat identifiable you, that's great. You've now got your, your main character in your memoir that you can draw over and over and over because you will. <laughs> In Scott McCloud's book, Understanding Comics, he actually talks about um, why cartoonists like to do sort of generic shapes. It's really fascinating. It's about human psychology. But basically, the more specificity and detail you have in an image, the more it actually prevents people from inserting themselves in the image. It becomes a, a, a bit of a, a an other. But if you have something that's a little generic and allows the person to insert themselves into it emotionally, this is a little weird, but hang with me here. If <laughs> the if you do something that's um, more generic, not too specifically identifiably one person, but sort of like a person, that allows the comic reader to say, I could be that person. So when I'm reading your memoir, I'm putting myself in the memoir. I'm in your shoes. So it's, it's an interesting phenomenon that happens when you merge words and pictures, which are comics. Um, one thing about the writing... Uh, uh, when we when we talk about comics, there's obviously the writing component. One thing that uh, trips people up a lot is um, thinking about how accurate your memoir needs to be. And again, I come from a journalistic background, so I completely get and respect that uh, that need. Um, you have to keep in mind with a memoir, and this pure written memoir is the same rules, the same with comics. This is not straight up journalism. If it's helpful for you to do fact checking, research on like what the weather was on the day when you broke up with your ex-boyfriend or whatever, if that's helpful and serves your narrative, go for it. But a lot of people tend to get stuck on those kinds of details and it's not actually as helpful as they think it is and it just prevents them from getting their work out. So um, don't get too hung up on being fact check truth. Think about what the truth is as you understand it through your perspective and that's a good lens to think like accurate ish is sort of the way I think of it. And for your characters in your memoir comic, you will also want to go through, especially if they're important, like in my case, my husband or my daughter, you'll want to go through an exercise like this, where you make a simplified form. Um, and I just like to think about like Charles Schultz peanuts, like the, the, this is not Charlie Brown, but these are the shapes that we know of in Charlie Brown, like his, his hair, his eyes, his, his zigzaggy shirt. Um, we know that in real life children, I mean, sometimes they do wear the same shirt every day, but usually they don't. <laughs> uh, but we know that when we see those zigzags, we're like, okay, that's Charlie Brown. So you might want to do that with some of your characters. And Charles Schultz is like the, the greatest genius comics artist ever. So you, you can never go wrong by reading like Charlie Brown and Peanuts. It's the best. Um, but uh, characters that you have in your memoir also don't need to be real. <laughs> and that always surprises people too. I did this workshop at the very beginning of the pandemic and a lot of people i was talking to lived alone and they were like how am i going to do a memoir when i have nobody to talk to and i don't have pets if you have a pet you could always talk to your dog or something but even that can seem a little kooky one person's solution that i thought was genius was that she made the appliances in her house other characters so like her stove became like a main character in her memoir yeah i know isn't that brilliant so <laughs> so these are the things like you you can do that in a plain old like a plain written memoir but in a comic, it can, you can really make that stove look, you can give it a physical personality. You make it, it's a square, right? It's a square with little things on it, but you can make that a real character. So there are really creative things that you can do to think of how who you're gonna put in your memoir. And again, like your household appliances, your pets. Um, if you talk to yourself a lot, which like a lot of us do, uh, you can make take that dialogue and maybe make it a phone call instead. Like, it's okay, you can do all those things. You can, it doesn't have to be journalism. Okay, so I've given my little spiel on that. 
Um, I wanted to talk really quickly about diary comic versus memoir. I This might be a little comics wonky, but I just wanted to mention it. These terms are often used interchangeably, um, and that's fine. <laughs> For me, in my mind, a diary comic, and these are very popular on Instagram too, are sort of like detailing one day or a specific incident. They're generally done extemporaneously, as in like in that time, they're not really edited. Um, these can be a great, great exercise if you've never done memoir comics before and you just kind of want to give it a shot. Give yourself an hour if you, if you have an hour <laughs> or 10 minutes if that's all you've got. Give yourself an hour and say, here's a thing that happened today. I'm going to give myself an hour and four panels or four post-it notes if that's what you need and just document it. And do that for like a week. It's a lot, I know, but that's how you get into sort of the mode of making memoir or diary comics. Because um, with memoir work specifically, uh, you're going to be thinking maybe about longer threads in your life, memories that maybe you connect, experiences that are not uh, necessarily uh, linear in time, but you're connecting them. A diary comic gives you a nice stepping stone into sort of thinking about how to frame experiences in your life and making a narrative out of things that are not like our lives are not narratives. We have to invent that framework around what has happened to us. So I always advise people to start with like a plain old diary comic, just start real easy and then maybe work into memoirs later uh, after you've done a few diary works. Um, so if you're thinking about making a memoir, um, I've done this a few times. One of the, <laughs> one of the, an important thing to do is to think about what your theme for your memoir is going to be. So in the case of extraordinary times, that was done for me. That was the pandemic and surviving the pandemic. Um, but if you're thinking back uh, on something that has happened uh, that you want to talk about in your life, you need to figure out what your theme is. So like your life is too vague. A thing that happened to me can work. Um, but usually you want to tell like a broader story, like not just this is the pandemic, but this is how I got through it. Um, this is how I surprised myself. This is how I overcame an extraordinary obstacle. These kinds of things are a lot more compelling and give the reader a lot more to uh, connect with. Um, do we have time to do them? We have a little bit of time. Um, what I'll do is I will give people an offline assignment if they really want to try this for themselves. Um, here's a prompt for you is tell me about the last time that you were brave. Not like the final time, but when, like recently, when were you brave? Tell me about that. And ask yourself with that prompt, what happened? How did it make you feel? Why did it make you feel that way? And for a bonus, what did you do about it? And I, again, I post-it notes are great for this. Each one of those questions can be one square. And you're right if you're thinking, I can't fit a lot into that square. That is the idea. You got to really boil it down to like a sentence or two. And that is the beginning. <laughs> that is how we get that concise narrative. So that's your that's a prompt that you can think about. Just start there. Um, there are a bunch of different prompts online if you want to get started with memoir work. There's a couple I can recommend to you if you want to Google them. Um, one of them is actually written uh, through the New York Times. It's called 650 Prompts for Narrative and Personal Writing. Long title, but it's, it's a fantastic place to start if you're looking to do memoir work and you're just kind of not sure how to congeal those thoughts. There's another, um, there's specifically, there's a memoir comics exercise by the fantastic cartoonist, Dr. Ebony Flowers, who won an Eisner and an Ignatz Award for her book, uh, Hot Comb. It, just a fantastic memoir and biography and just general narrative. She broke a lot of barriers with that book. She calls it her sister images exercise. So if you Google Ebony Flowers sister images exercise, it'll come up. And it's basically about attaching a recent memory to an old memory and trying to kind of find a thread if there is a connecting thread. That can be great for sort of mining, getting into the habit of mining details in your life and trying to build a narrative out of that. Um, so like a strong memory from this week, and does it make you think of something else? What is it? Let's talk about those two things and put them next to each other and see what happens. Um, I know there's a barrier for a lot of people with memoir work that they don't know how they felt about something and that's very normal. So just ask yourself why. Uh, that's a very old memoir writing trick. Ask yourself why like five times. So I felt this, I, this thing happened to me and I reacted this way. Why? Because blah, blah, blah. Why? Because blah, blah, blah. And you just do it like five times. You will start to get into the, the feeling part of things. So if it doesn't come to you naturally, just ask yourself why over and over and over. Be annoying. Annoy yourself with it. <laughs> You'll get to the nugget that way. Um, and lastly, I just wanted to address three common problems that people talk to me about when they're trying to do memoir work um, that I want to just assure you that you're not alone if you encounter these issues and encourage you 
to, to keep trying and keep going because your story is worth it. Um, the first issue that a lot of people have is they don't think they have anything worth saying. They don't think that what's going on in their life is worthy of being documented. Um, I want to assure you that your voice is necessary and that if you feel like you have a story, it is worthy of being told. Uh, as I said with my own memoir work, if I didn't write down what happened to my family during the pandemic, nobody, like the New York Times was not going to send a reporter to my house to document it. Like I had to do that. Um, and I mean, I didn't have to do it. I wanted to do it. But same thing for your story. If you feel like I just want to put this out there. If nobody reads it, it's fine. Maybe somebody will read it 300 years from now. That's okay. But the, the doing of the work is so important and getting that onto the page is so important. And yes, it is worthy. So if you're, if, if that block is in your mind, like this is not important, nobody cares. I care. I want you to send it to me. I care. Okay. The second thing is, uh, as I mentioned earlier, some people get really bogged down and, oh, it's not historically accurate. Um, I don't know exactly if that person said this exact thing. Your memory is your main tool for memoir work. Like if you really feel you want to research the meteorolog meteorological records of the day of whatever happened to you, if that's helpful, okay. But I really caution you, you don't need to do that. Um, don't let that bury you. That will just send you down a rabbit hole in most cases. Um, and the third thing that often happens is people get overwhelmed. They feel like they have this epic story they need to tell, either in like biography or memoir form, about like how I survived World War II. I mean, it, it, it's it's like a humongous story to tell. And the old journalistic trick that also works really well with memoirs is to start really, really small. Um, stories that are too massive to get your hands around, just just drill in really tiny. So let a small story tell a big picture. So. Um, if you uh, focus on one person, so in my case with my memoir work, I focus on me, <laughs> surprise, um, but it's, it's very much like the minutia of my life. And it sounds, <laughs> when I was writing it, I was like, who cares about this stuff? This is so boring. But it told in some, the bigger picture of raising a preschooler during the pandemic with no, no real child support. In some, it told a much bigger story that I did not realize until it was done, frankly. So go small. If you feel overwhelmed and you just don't know where to start, just drill in really tiny, get really small. And small stories can always tell a much bigger, bigger, bigger story. You will be surprised. Okay, that's my spiel. <laughs> I hope that was helpful. Uh, I really had a great time explaining my work and my process. And um, I, I had a blast. So <laughs> thank you so much. And thank you. Uh, that was just fascinating um, hearing especially hearing about your process and having you share your work um, and sort of reminding us all about the early days of the pandemic <laughs> washing and, groceries <laughs> yes <laughs> right <laughs> that scene of you in the airport where you didn't want to touch anything um, it, it just was so um, it just brought it all back um, none of us had masks like I just oh my god I, I when I read the work and I just can't believe how late masks came into the picture. It's just, it's just you forget now, but it's yeah, and yeah it's it's amazing. So yeah, yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. I just it was. I, I thank you, thank you so much um, for sharing thank it you. with us. Thank you. Um, I, I there is a comment for you um, from sure. one of our viewers, um, so I wanted to be sure to share that. Um, it's from Ben and Denise. We arrived here late, but enjoyed what we heard and saw. Thank Went you. to Maria's website to learn more about what she does and we'll join her mailing list. Have a peaceful evening and thank you. I appreciate that very much. Thank you so much. My mailing list is the best way to keep in touch. So yeah. <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, I did just have one question for you. Um, sure. Early on in the uh, pandemic, we uh, we hosted a community art project here at the library and people sent in their artwork. Mm. Um, and it was clear that people used creativity to help them cope. Yes. And I was just wondering if you could talk about how your projects helped you cope with what you were going through. Yeah, I think I remember seeing that call. Uh, I don't know if I missed it or, um, but I remember seeing that. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't, <laughs> I didn't get in on that. Uh, yeah, it's, this was all I had. And I, I, we were talking about this uh, before the, the thing started. I'm happy smiley now. Uh, I have childcare now. My daughter's in preschool and she's doing great. Um, I love being her mom. I, uh, 
Like there's no, there's no complaints about that. It's, uh, I just didn't have anything going for me uh, in the last, but when I didn't have childcare and I, I was the primary parent because my husband was keeping our roof over our head, um, I was dealing with a lot of anger that I couldn't give her something better. She's an only child. So um, I was very worried about her socialization, her loneliness. Mm -hmm. uh, I also was dealing with my own loneliness and isolation. Like we all were, like we all were in different ways. Um, and this, this project literally was my only, I get a little emotional thinking about it. Um, it was my only connection to what I felt was like my true self. Um, because I, I have not been an artist my entire adult life. I have been, it's been a real struggle for me to land on art after going through engineering school, journalism, marketing. <laughs> like, it's been a very long journey of discovery to, for me to realize that uh, this is really what I need and what I want to do with my life. And I had just before the pandemic started, I had just started feeling some momentum in that direction and feeling like that was being stripped away from me for reasons that were not my fault and I couldn't do anything about was devastating. So this was my one way to say, I'm still keeping my toe in the water. I'm not doing anything even close to what I really want to be doing. I mean, I'm parenting my child. That's the most important thing. But in terms of my professional and sense of self, my whole self, um, outside of being a mother, uh, this was my toe in that water. And, and sometimes it was just the fingernail. Hanging. <laughs> but knowing that I had that, um, even if nobody read it, which thankfully people did, but like, even if no one read it, it was like, I could look at it at two in the morning when I should have been sleeping and go, I, I still made something. And um, especially since I had to stop working, I, I, I also freelance, uh, I had to stop working to take care of my daughter. So I literally dropped out of the workforce. I, I couldn't work at all. Um, and, you know, I, I, my sense of self just, I talk about a lot in my work, but like my sense of self disappeared. So this was, this was my salvation in a way. Um, and it's not, doesn't have the level of polish I wish it did. Like there's so many things I wish I could have done differently, but I just simply didn't have the time. <laughs> so yeah. I just did the best with what I could. And uh, uh, in retrospect, I'm very proud of it. And, uh, but at the time I didn't, I didn't realize that. Well, congratulations. I think, I think you created uh, a couple of amazing books. Thank you so um, much. I really appreciate that. Yeah, and I, and I hope everyone gets a chance to, um, to take a look. Yes, you can get it from the library. <laughs> you yes. can buy it from me or from the library. It's great. Yes. <laughs> Please yes. check it out. <laughs> Definitely. Thank you so um, much. And it's, uh, it's almost 8 o'clock, so I'm going to end this live stream. And um, thank you again for joining us tonight. And um, we so enjoyed hearing about your work. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And good night, everyone. Good night.